Zenoba Sharon, the third prince of the Sharon kingdom, a Myko one, who possessed superhuman strength from birth. He's a deviant. Undeniably a deviant. You could perhaps say that he's a figurine otaku taken to the extreme. Before he had noticed, he was gazing at dolls every day. When he feels like it, he'll gently pat the dolls. He'll never treat a doll roughly. Though he'll be unable to suppress his superhuman strength when he gets excited, he'll never make a mistake in handling the dolls. He might be in love with dolls. Love. Right, he loves dolls. He dotes on them. For example, in his room is a copper statue of a naked woman. I hear that he had caught sight of it in town, and bought it on impulse. It's the naked figure of a slim, but bewitching girl. When I had first looked for Zenoba's room, he was hugging that statue in the nude. It was my fault for trying to surprise him by entering without knocking. There's no doubt that I was in the wrong, but when Zenoba saw me he flusteredly put on clothes, and bowed his head in an unsightly manner. I'm fine even if he doesn't go out of his way to explain what he was doing hugging it naked. His love for dolls is abnormal. It still snows occasionally, up here in the north. It's cold outside, and it goes without saying how cold a statue would be. Though on the verge of getting frostbite, he was satisfying his desires. It was devotion to a level that no one else could imitate. However, it's not abnormal to an extent that I can't understand it. In my past life, I had used figurines as well, after all. However, I've never used the holy statue, Roxy figurine, for that. It's something unacceptable after all. Speaking of which, I didn't see a Roxy doll in Zenoba's room. Did he perhaps leave it in Sharon? That Zenoba, on a certain day. He suddenly performed a dojza in front of me. It was something that happened at night. In my hand was the figurine I was making. Shizu, please teach me how to create dolls figurines. Over this past month, I've been continuing to tell Zenoba to wait a little longer. Though he had been patiently waiting like a pet dog, it seems that he finally reached his limits. Did we not make a promise? Why have we not began our lessons yet? Zenobe was a little angry. Of course I had no reason to refuse. I had promised him after all. For the sake of teaching him I had been practicing to rehabilitate my skills. There was also the fact that my everyday life hadn't calmed down yet that I was still far away from achieving my ultimate goal, and that I hadn't found a chance to teach him yet. My dear Zenoba, this training of mine will be harsh, you know. I had deliberately spoken rather affectedly, and Zenoba was taken aback. He then nodded solemnly. Of course. Shizu, please do not underestimate me. Even if I have to vomit blood, I'll learn the heart of Shizu's doll creation method. MMMN. You have spirit. And like that, I began to teach Zenobo my doll creation methods. Using the time before bed, I'd teach him about 1-2 hours a day. I had my own motives as well. His love towards dolls was the real thing. Additionally, he was royalty, he was rich. I had given up on coloring the dolls, and on my dreams of mass producing dolls, but it might be possible with his influence. First. I'd mass-produce Roxy dolls. In the past I had created it as a unique item, but the art of creating bronze statues as well as the art of creating western-styled dolls existed in this world. Even if the craftsmanship quality falls, appropriating these two techniques should allow me to mass-produce them. After that would be Ruijured dolls. Using the real history as a basis, I would write books that glorified the superd clan. It would be filled with battle scenes that the people of this world love so much, and in contrast to the depictions of famous heroes, it would be about a man who never gave up and the suffering and conflicts that he faced as he endeavored. It would come with a figurine. The figurine would come with the book as a gift. After all, it makes a big difference to show the protagonist visually. If this turned out to be a success, it might be nice to produce books that depict Adroxy and her glorious exploits next. All right, we can do it. Though it might be impossible on my own, no matter what they may say about him, Zenoba is still royalty. He's rich. He's got passion as well. As a partner for this enterprise, 
there'd surely be no one better. There's a saying about counting chickens before they've hatched. It was surely a fitting description for me at the time. Well then, I'll teach you my secret techniques. Yes. Shizu. Our doll creating was just beginning. Let's just start with the conclusion. He couldn't do it. Zenoba couldn't use voiceless earth magic to create dolls. There were two reasons. First there was the fact that he couldn't control chantless magic. Second of all, there was the fact that he lacked my overwhelming mana capacity. Thinking about it, there are hardly any people in this world who can use chantless magic. Among the people I've met, there were only Orsted, Fitz, and Sophie. In this school there was one more, a teacher who could use voiceless wind magic. However, I was told that he died last year. Since I had been able to use it since childhood, it had never really occurred to me but chantless magic was a high-level technique. Thinking back on it, Eris and Ghislaine weren't able to learn chantless magic either. Since it was like that, there was no way a person who just started learning magic like Zenoba would be able to use it. Moreover, the issue of mana capacity is an important one. When I create figurines, my mana is consumed continuously. I use up a considerable amount of mana to produce them. It was then that I understood it for the first time. It seems that somehow or other, the amount of mana I have is far greater than others. No, strictly speaking I had vaguely noticed it. I thought that I had more than the average. However, I hadn't thought that it would be so far above the average. When I was an adventurer and I had seen magicians who ran out of mana, I would think something like they've been wasting their mana on useless things. To express things numerically, if we said that a normal magician had 100 mana points, I had thought that I was around 500 or so. However, the reality is that it seems I have much, much more than that. To think that Zenoba couldn't produce even a single doll part. Well, leaving me aside for now, Zenoba put in great effort. Waking up early, he juice up his mana until he fainted, then when he woke up, he juice up his mana until he fainted. He repeated this all day long. It might be because he'd continued to use his mana until he reached his limits, but his cheeks were thinning and starting to sag a little. His face was like a skeleton, and was wet with tears and mucus. He didn't have talent in the thing he wanted to do most. That much was obvious. I've done something quite cruel to him. I reflected on it. Doing so, I apologized. I'm sorry. Zenoba shook his head and replied without any power. No, if I was more talented. The figure of a man stricken with grief. The figure of a loser, surrounded by a shroud of sorrow. It wouldn't be good to give up here. I think about things. It really is quite pitiful that Zenoba can't even manage the first step in creating figurines. Even so, it can't be helped since chantless magic is impossible for him. Since he lacks in mana as well, it's probably impossible for him to create figurines using the same method that I do. Alright. Let's change the creation method. I spontaneously reach such a conclusion. There's another way of doing it. The grieving Zenoba suddenly recovered, and now leans in towards me. Yeah. Let's try a method that uses mana as little as possible. Saying this, I create a lump of earth. It's clay. Though I used magic to create this, you should probably be able to find this naturally in the wild. Just where do people get clay? I hear that famous potters like to seclude themselves in the mountains, but the mountains and forests in this world are dangerous. Although, those golem things seem to be made of something like clay and you can probably obtain clay even without having to dig up the earth yourself. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to carve it. Carving. It's the oldest method, the most reliable method, but also the most difficult method. I'll create the figurine parts one by one by carving the clay. If I do things like this, it should be possible to create figurines even without using mana. There's the problem of lacking the appropriate carving tools, but we can probably work it out by looking for a magic item in town. In the past, I've seen things like knives that can cut through stone like butter. I see, Shizu. With this method, even I should be able to do it. Said Zenoba in a cheerful voice. 
His expression was filled with hope. His hope was very simply crushed. Zenoba couldn't use his fingers skillfully. The cause was an ability he possessed since birth. Superhuman strength. Indeed, he was hindered by that superhuman strength. He could keep it in check enough that he didn't destroy everything. However, that was as far as he could control it. It was difficult to perform the delicate work required to carve the parts. Zenoba persevered each day with bloodshot eyes. His passion was the real thing. Without even a wink of sleep, he immersed himself in doll creation until he almost starved himself to death. Because it hadn't gone the way he had wanted, he redid things again and again. Each time he would cry, shout and let out strange noises. And then it would be finished, the doll that he had created from scratch. It couldn't be called beautiful by any means. The workmanship was bad, and had it been in my previous life, I might have laughed at it in scorn. It was like the badly done joke photoshops that you could find in abundance on the internet. However, I knew. I knew that this was his passion. I'd never laugh at him. However, even without me laughing, Zenoba himself could tell that it was badly done. Shizu, I can't do it. I, can't do it the way Shizu does it. Zenoba cried. Unable to create what he saw in his mind, he cried. Stricken with grief, he seemed like he had no energy left to stand. From the beginning of our lessons to the end was two months. Even seeing Zenoba's depressed and worn out expression, there was nothing I could do. And that's how it is. I had consulted Fit Senpai. Asking someone else for advice about my student, I was truly shameful as a Shizu. However, I still wanted to rely on someone else's wisdom. Zenoba was too pitiful after all. Making balls? Fitz Senpai couldn't really understand. Whilst sitting on some chairs that were lined up inside the library, he listened to my story and then tilted his head in puzzlement. Yes. That's basically how it is. Using earth magic, I create a simple doll to show him. It was a simple doll without any clothing, and was a bit like a Sarabobo too. A, eh, amazing. Fitz Senpai stared at my hands, and looked fixedly at the doll I had finished making. Then as though wondering if he could do it as well, he gathers mana into his fingertips and creates a wiggly something or other that was a bit like slime. Considering that he had just tried to copy me on the spot, he really was amazing. However, it seems that it didn't turn out the way he wanted. In the end Fitz Senpai sighed and gave up. I can't do it. Well. Creating figurines is something that I've been diligently practicing for a long time now, and is an accumulation of the techniques that I've studied. If it was something that could be easily imitated just by looking, I'd cry. Nevertheless, it feels to me that if Fitch Senpai practiced, he'd be able to do it. In the first place, he's someone who can use chantless magic. This is something that a normal person can't imitate. That's true. I had thought that another method involving carving from a lump of clay would work out, but... Since he was clumsy with his hands, he couldn't do it, you said. Fitz Senpai let out a mmmmm and was thinking about it with his hand to his chin. It seems to be a habit of his to bring his hand to his chin when he thinks. It might be because of the sunglasses, but it looks awfully uncomfortable. Incidentally, when he's awkward or embarrassed, He'll scratch his cheek or behind his ears. It's an action that's quite suiting of his age, and suits him really well. However, since elves are long-lived, he might not be as young as he seems. MMMM, let's see. I'm not sure if you'll be able to use them as a reference, but there are people like him in the Azura capital as well. People like him? MMN. People who have things they want to do themselves, but lack the ability or skill. What do these people do? When I asked that, Fitz Senpai seemed a little reluctant to answer and scratched himself behind the ear. Um, well, they get slaves to do it. Ha! Huh. 3. According to Fitz Senpai, those people in the capital had the knowledge, but lacked the skill. That's why they would buy slaves, train those slaves, and had the slaves create what they wanted. According to what I've heard, that Zenoba Kun likes the dolls that you make, Rudeus Kun, and because he wants more of them, 
he wants to create them himself, right? Huh? Was that what I said? Um, that's how it sounded to me. Is that so? But still, normally even if you liked figurines, you'd just paint them yourself or remodel them, you wouldn't think to create them from scratch yourself. When I was alive, at best I was an average remodeler. I'm sure that Zenoba Kun wanted you as his personal doll maker, Rudius Kun, but he himself knew that it'd be impossible and so that might be why he said something like becoming your student, right? Well, I don't think it'd be impossible though. Employed by Zenoba in the Sharon Royal Palace, and spending each day making figurines. In the end, a lifestyle like that might not be bad. Working for a royal palace would probably mean a stable income. Speaking of which, how much does Fitz Senpai get from Princess Ariel each month? It feels like it'd be rude to ask, huh? Well, I'll try suggesting it to Zenoba once. Thank you very much. Amen, you're very welcome. When I bowed, Fitz Senpai smiled bashfully. Why is it that I feel so startled when I see that smiling face of his? It's a mystery. The mysterious man, Fitz. Truly a mystery. Buy a slave, teach them, and they'll be able to create dolls. When I told Zenobe about this idea, he agreed. As I expected, he began making arrangements to buy a slave with great joy. It seems that he had originally wanted to create them himself. However, it seems that he realized that since it was impossible, there was no choice but to give up on it. Unexpectedly, the method that Fitz Senpai had suggested was typical for this world. Be that as it may, for a student to ask their Shizu to teach a slave instead of themselves was quite rude it seems. After all, in the beginning Zenoba tried to learn it until he was vomiting blood. That's why although he couldn't bring up the topic, when I suggested it instead, he was relieved. And so our next monthly break, we'll be going to the slave market. Once again, I expressed my thanks to Fitz Senpai. As someone who gave me advice when I was troubled, I really was thankful to him. I see. It'd be good if you found a good slave. And like that, the topic came to a close. Though it had come to a close. Afterwards Fitz Senpai was a little fidgety. What to say? Speaking of which, I'm free as well next monthly break. Is that so? Amen. And so, um, I don't have anything to do, and I was thinking to visit the town, but it's not like there's anywhere I wanted to go in particular. I don't have any friends, so I'd be going by myself. From his fragmented speech, and his occasional glances towards me, he conveyed what he meant. Is this okay for a guard? Wouldn't it be bad if he wasn't near the princess when something happened? Well, that's not for me to worry about. I'm sure Luke would be able to deal with it somehow. Um, would you like to come with us, senpai? Is that okay? Wouldn't I bother you? It's fine. As thanks for your advice, I'll treat you to a meal. Really? Then I'll accept. Saying that, Fitz Senpai smiled bashfully, like that, the plan was for the three of us to go to the slave market. I had originally thought to make the subheading one of the following. Rudius vs. the Nob. Shizu's mana capacity is the greatest in the world. A flower in each hand? Heart throbbing shopping with Prince Super Strength and Prince Bashful. But I decided against it. It's nice to meet you. I'm Fitz. When Fitz met Zenoba, he was a little nervous. If he's a senpai, then he should act more like one. More grand and dignified. Or so I was thinking, but the thing about him being shy around strangers might really be the case. Zenoba steps forward with a jerk. Third Prince of the Sharon Kingdom, Zenoba Shiroa. Zenoba was getting cocky, so I kick him behind the knees. Four. He topples a little. It's not like I have plans to reinforce the pecking order. It's just that it'd probably be best to be a little more humble when meeting a senior for the first time. Zenoba, the one who came up with our current plan was Fitz Senpai. Pay him your respects properly. When I said this, Zenoba bent at the hips and greeted him. I understand, Shizu. I do not believe I have had the pleasure of meeting you before. 
I am Sharon Kingdom's third prince, Zenoba Sharon. Please to make your acquaintance. N, no, it's all go, fine. Because you're a person of royalty, please stop with that. While waving his arms in a fluster, Fitch Senpai took his place behind me. Seeing that, Zenoba stared in wonder. There was quite an astonishing gap between his appearance, the rumors about him, and his current speech and conduct. Despite being a magician of voiceless incantation, and being called Silent Fitz, he was acting afraid like this. Despite wearing sunglasses, and looking a little. Once you spoke to him, he was quite typical of his age. He's a good senpai who looks after his kuhai. Well then, now that we've all met, let's go. At my command, the two begin to walk. The slave market is in the commerce street. The slave trading business was just barely scraping along on the Middle East continent and in the southern parts of the central continent. However, it's different here in the north. Here, the slave trade is perfectly legalized in most countries, and is endorsed. To the countries in the northern parts of the central continent, the slave trade is an important business. They're reliant on it to the point where the countries wouldn't be able to survive without it. There are a variety of reasons for a person to become a slave. Those who are orphaned in a war. Those who are up to their ears in debt due to bad harvests, and so sell their children. Those who sell themselves off to save their family. It's also rumored that in the dark side of the Thieves' Guild, there's something like a slave farm. The Renoa kingdom that is included in the Magic Triumvirate would survive even without slaves. However, Heading further east are a great number of poor villages that have to sell children at fixed intervals. Those slaves are bought by warrior and mercenary groups or countries and used as disposable soldiers in warfare. However, there are those in the business that are connected with the Kingdom of Azure. Slaves that are beautiful or have a lot of ability are brought to the Kingdom of Azure to sell. The Kingdom of Azure is a place that doesn't know poverty. Though there are those who live in destitution. There's nobody who suffers from starvation. Slaves who are brought there are basically winners. I honestly think that you've lost the moment you become a slave though. Also, because the slaves here in the north are excellent and robust, there are those who come all the way here to make their purchases. There are many looking to buy people. So it's this place, huh? In fact, I've gathered information at the Adventurer's Guild beforehand. In a district as big as this, there are numerous slave markets. This particular district has five of them. Though there are five, they range in quality. For example, I was told about one of them absolutely never buy from there. I was told that in a slave market with low credibility, there are slaves who are diseased or dying that people try to pawn off to others with a straight face. Well, I also heard that you could occasionally find a bargain there. But since we're all beginners we'd all have no way to tell the difference. Because we're new to this, we head to a better slave market. It's quite different to my homeland. Zenoba nodded in interest. The slave market looked just like a normal building at a glance. Made of stone and earth, it was a typical building for these parts. Judging by the standards of this world, this building was on the large side. There were three of them in a row. Written above the door that served as the entrance was Ryum Company, Slave Trade Center. There were fires burning at the entrance, and standing around were men who wore leather armor over winter clothing. They were unshaven, but didn't give a particularly bad feeling, I've spent two years as an adventurer though, so it might be that I've become used to this kind of appearance. I probably would have thought different about them in the past. The slave market isn't outside huh? Fitz Senpai's voice sounded surprised. In the north, there are many slave markets that are held indoors. The reason is simple. Shall we enter? When we enter, a waft of hot air surrounds our bodies. There are fires throughout the inside of the building. And on top of the countless daises are naked slaves lined up in a row. The reason they don't do it outside is basically because it's cold. The slaves would catch colds. However, because indoor markets would lose passing customers, there are those who still do it outside. There are a lot of different sales places, aren't there? Shizu, what should we do? 
Since it's my first time buying as well, first let's look around as appropriate. We start to walk around without much of a plan. The eight slave stands are merchants associated with the Ryum company. Gathered around each place are possibly those who are selling slaves they've bought. They probably alternate when they've sold out, or it might be something like switching over after their designated time slot has passed. It's quite a successful business, and there are crowds of people around each of the stands. Their outfits are quite varied, there are those like me who are dressed like adventurers, those who like Fitz and Pian Zenoba are dressed like nobles, as well as those dressed like merchants, townspeople, commoners and students. Among them are merchants whose aim seems to be the resale of slaves. Further away from the stalls are those who have just purchased their slaves and are having a chat with each other. Could the seedy looking ones be pickpockets? No, pickpockets wouldn't come to a guarded place like this. They might be slaves who are sent by their masters to purchase other slaves. Nonetheless, I clutch onto the coin purse under my robes. This time I've been entrusted with the funds. It wouldn't be a joke if they were stolen. You, you wah, you wah. They're really all naked. Seeing the slave stalls, Fitz Senpai's eyes are staring in surprise. His face is bright red. Because he's wearing a mantle I can't really tell, but he seems to be bashfully standing pigeon toed. T, they're big, huh? To become like that. Following his line of sight. I find that he was looking at some slaves who seemed like warriors, being introduced as featured goods. Whether man or woman, every one of them was well built. In particular, the female warrior in the middle was good. She was big. It goes without saying that her stature was big, but her bulging chest was something that made you look on with longing. Though it seems that goods as big as those would get in the way of battle, as I understand from Eris, in this world even if they're huge. There's not really a problem. Senpai, is this your first time at a slave market? Eh? Ah, MMN. While scratching behind his ear, one of Fit Senpai's hands was already holding his mantle in front in embarrassment. He was probably worried about the position of his thing. Truly the reaction of a DT. I was like that as well, once. Now? Well, look, right now my motive is a little different. Why you sure are used to it huh, Rudius Khan? Though Fitz Senpai was my senpai, it seems that he still hasn't had any experience. When I think about it like that, I feel like boasting about my victory a bit, but I've only done it once too, and my partner ran away from me. It's not something I can be proud about. Still, with just that as experience, I really am a little calmer about these things. It's a problem now that I'm too calm, though. I think once you've had some experience as well, senpai, you'll more or less grow used to it. Why, you think? Wait, so you've had some experience, Rudius Kun. Fitz senpai seems a little down. He really is young, huh? Truly young. Shizu, we have no need for warriors, so what we should be looking for is a race that can use magic and is good with their hands, right? As if to say he had no interest in these things. Zenoba jerked his chin in another direction. It seems that he essentially doesn't have interest in women. Technically he is a widower, so it might not be that he has no interest in sex at all. If it's a race that's good with their hands, I guess it has to be dwarves, right? It seems so. A dwarf who can use earth magic would probably be best. Although I don't really think there's a need to fuss over the race. Saying that, I have a look around one of the stands. Though it's a slave market as big as this, the number of dwarf slaves is few. The majority of the slaves are those with combat ability, and there are almost no slaves who would seem to be suitable for crafting. Um, Rudius Kun. If you were to teach them magic, then I think a young child who can't use magic would be better. Fitz Senpai gives some advice. Why? Chantless magic is something that you can learn easily as a child. Ah, is that how it is? Amen. I think that after you become ten, you basically can't learn it. Is that how it is? But thinking about it, though Sophie could do it, Eris couldn't. Could there be a relationship with age? Is there a relationship with one's age? Amen. From my experience, 
my master's words, and the words of the teachers at school, I've concluded that I shouldn't be wrong but. Ah, uh, also, if you start using magic from when you're about five, your mana capacity increases tremendously. If you want them to create dolls using your method, Rudeus Kun, it'd be better to have greater mana capacity, right? If you start using magic from when you're about five, your mana capacity increases tremendously. I had come up with a similar hypothesis in the past, but this is the first time hearing it from someone else. I've heard that your mana capacity is determined at birth, but... That's wrong. It certainly says that in the textbook, but because you can't increase it past the age of 10, I think they're probably misunderstanding. I see. So if you start using magic from when you're about 5, your mana capacity increases tremendously huh? Since I've been using magic since 2 or 3 and my mana capacity is large, it's something that I can assent to. Also, since Fitz Senpai said he had personal experience, he's probably concealing a considerable amount of mana as well. Fitz Senpai has been using magic since young as well, huh? Amen. That's. In the past, I was saved by my master, and at that time I begged them to teach me. Heh. Perhaps he was attacked by some monster in the forest. No, since he was young, the chance that it was a kidnapping is high. In this world there's quite a kidnapping boom going on. Since Senpai would probably be a Bishonin if he took off those sunglasses, I can understand that kidnappers would aim for him. That master of yours can also use chantless magic? Amen. They're an amazing person, you know. I respect them even now. Is that so? In that case I'd really like to meet them one day. A person who can use chantless magic? If I met him, my magic might be able to improve a little. At any rate, I'd probably benefit somehow. Or so I was thinking, but Fitz Senpai smiled bitterly. Um, that's probably impossible. I see. So there's someone quite important after all, huh? Fitz is a guard to the princess after all. His master might be a court magician or something. For example, by luck a court magician saved him, and then using that connection became that magician's disciple. He then grew up and became the prince's guard. It might be something like that. If they're a court magician of the kingdom of Azura, then they should probably be able to use chantless magic at least. An important person. They're not really, um, they're someone from the Fidoa region. Uh, they were wrapped up in the teleportation huh? In that case, their whereabouts would be unknown. That's um. It'd be good if they were alive. They are alive. I've already found them after all. Speaking of which, he did mention that he was studying the teleportation incident because he was looking for an acquaintance. Wait, if he found them recently then? Huh? Then why can't I meet them? Hoo ooh. It's a secret. Fitz Senpai laughed bashfully. Why is it that when I see that smile, my heart starts to throb like this? Though I can love traps when they're too deep. I was sure that I wasn't a homo but. Perhaps it's just a kind of drastic measure. Following Fitz Senpai's advice, we search for a slave. A slave that's about five, if they're younger than that, there's a good chance they wouldn't understand us. A dwarf, it's better that they're dexterous so that if it comes down to it, they'll be able to use the carving method, and a cute little girl, my personal preference. A girl. Their gender doesn't matter to me, but Shizu. Aren't you getting our objectives mixed up? Rudeus Kun. As we piled up the criteria one by one, once we got to the final criterion, they looked at me with eyes of criticism. Tua? Since we were all guys here, I had thought that they'd have been non bored instead, but. Well, it seems like they aren't the type. If it was Elinalyze, then she might have approved. If it was her. She might be suggesting we find cute little boys instead. Lately her interest in Shoda has been awakening after all. But still, if we buy a five-year-old then we shouldn't expect too much regarding education. They might not even understand our words. If it turns out that they can only speak the beast god language, then we wouldn't be able to teach them magic after all. I can speak the beast god language, so if that's the case then I can teach them. What? 
You can speak the beast god language, Shizu? As expected of you. Hyuu, well that's how it is. At Zenoba's praise, I start to feel proud and I hold out my chest. Though I look like this, I'm multilingual. I've also taught a five-year-old before. Speaking of which, I wonder if Sophie is doing well. Even without seeing a line Elias and Fitz Senpai, you could say that elves are really to my taste, or that they had the type of face that Japanese of the fantasy generation preferred. Elves brought to mind something like a slim and beautiful man and woman pair. If I remember correctly, Sophie was roughly my age, so she might be 15 right now. She's probably become considerably beautiful. According to Paul, she could use magic, and on top of that, she has green hair. Since I'd probably hear rumors of her right away, I'd probably be able to find her immediately. I haven't heard a single rumor though. I wonder where she is right now. Anyway, since we've already decided on the criteria, let's go ask a sales assistant. I head to place where help office is written. The man at the reception had a completely clean shaven head, and when combined with his beard, was quite a macho man. Though he looked at Fitz Senpai and I with suspicious looks, when he saw Zenoba he accepted it and nodded. Um, excuse me, we're actually. The macho man ignored my words, and spoke to Zenoba who was behind me. Yo, welcome on san What is it that you're looking for? A warrior for a guard? Right now we have guys that can teach the sword as well, you know. We also have some magicians but it'd probably be better to head to the magic university for that. Or could it be that you're looking for those? No, no, I shouldn't say it. You don't seem all that popular after all. We've got a real voluptuous one in her twenties you know. She was recently a whore so that would be perfect as well. Of course they earned the siega. The macho man then ate Zenoba's iron claw, and was raised into the air. Don't ignore Shizu. Yakking on and on like that, I'll pull out that noisy tongue of yours and rip off your jaw, you know. H, hey! What are you doing? The guards around had immediately moved to capture Zenoba, but he was undisturbed. Conversely, with just a shake he sent them flying. MMN well, he's quite high powered. The muscular guards are being swung around by a skinny otaku looking guy. It's surreal. So this is the power of a Maiko, huh? Oops, this isn't the time to be standing here watching. No. Zenoba, stop this. House. Yes. At my voice, Zenoba released his grip. In the face of the suddenly motionless Zenoba, the guards stop moving as well. I face the guards and bow my head. I'm truly sorry. He just got a little excited. No, it's fine. Just don't act too violently, alright? We'll draw our swords the next time. They easily let us off. Though there was a little fear in their eyes, they decided that they hadn't seen anything this time. It wouldn't be good even if they poked their noses in further. What surprised me was that the moment Zenobe was caught, Fitz Senpai had prepared his stance before I did. It was an extremely fast and decisive movement. As expected of the Princess Guard. You could also say that I was just cowardly though. Anyway, it seems that there isn't anyone particularly vigilant here, uh? After all, using adventurer terms, the guards around here were only C rank, or at best B rank. Well whatever. I'll continue speaking to him. We're looking for a dwarf around the age of five. I speak to the macho man again. Around five? While cowering, he looked over the list in his hand. Flipping through the pages. He squints his eyes. There aren't many dwarves in the first place here and on top of that a five-year-old. So the criteria really were too strict? The dwarves basically live on the Millie's continent after all. Even with all the kidnapping going on, the dwarf slaves basically don't end up here. As long as it's a race that's good with crafting, even if they aren't a dwarf it won't be a problem. We definitely wouldn't complain if they were young though. Oh. There is one. The man tapped a part of the list with his finger. A dwarf girl of six years old. Because of her parents' debts, the whole family were sold into slavery. Her health is a little on the bad side though. It might be because of malnutrition. Well, 
she'll probably be back to normal if you feed her. She can't speak the human language, and though it's natural for a six-year-old, she can't read either. I see. What happened to her parents? Both her parents have been sold. It's something I heard in a tavern during my days as an adventurer, but amongst the dwarves exist a social class who believe that they can live with nothing but the mountains. It'd be fine to leave the Millie's continent and work in the Dragon King mountain range, but occasionally there'd be idiots who guessed wrong and headed too far north, and without re-entering the mountains were unable to make a living. They'd even get their families wrapped up, truly useless fathers. For now, let's just meet them. At the macho man's call, after a while a single merchant appears. He's a man with dark skin. It's not just suntan. He's probably from the Bigurito continent, or one of his parents was from the Bigurito continent. He's a little fat and drenched in sweat. Though there's a cloth hung over his shoulder for wiping up the sweat, that cloth too is soaked. Though the smell of sweat wafts about, this marketplace is hot so it can't be helped. I had already taken off my robe as well, and Zenobin undid his mantle as well. Fitz Senpai is dressed as usual with a nonchalant look. His face is red though. For a different reason. Hello. I'm the branch manager of one of the Ryum firm's associate firms, the Domni firm, Feburito. The merchant names himself. He turns to Zenoba and extends his hand. Zenoba was reaching his hand towards the merchant's face, so I took his hand instead. Hello. I'm Rudius of the Quagmire. I give that name a go, and for an instant looks at me puzzled but immediately smiles broadly. Oh, so you were Quagmire. I've heard about you. Just before winter, you killed a stray dragon. I was just lucky, the dragon was weakened you see. The name of the A-ranked adventurer, Rudius of the Quagmire is known in these parts as well, somehow. The efforts I put into spreading my name weren't just for show. Today I'm looking for a dwarf but... Feburito glances at Zenoba and Fitz Senpai. Right. These two are contributing to the funds. We're looking for a child so that we can teach them crafting from the young age. I tried saying something appropriate. It wasn't a lie. I see, so it was something like that. Though it isn't a good one that I'd really recommend. Anyway, please just have a look. It's this way. We listen to Feburito and from the other side of the market, move into the neighboring building. We're heading to a slave storehouse. Though I say a storehouse, there are iron bars attached to pulleys lined up in a row, and inside those are slaves. The inside of the bars are about a tatami mat in size and all have one or two slaves inside. Before they're brought to the marketplace, they're washed and covered in oil, but right now they stink. The slaves inside are crying children, and glaring slaves who send killing intent our way. Inside the warehouse are a number of people like us who are directly trading. Feburito walks between the barred cages. He then calls for a man standing to the side. It's probably a subordinate. We head further in. We stop in front of one of the cages. Inside the cage is a girl with empty eyes, sitting with her knees huddled up. It's this one, oi, bring him out. Right. Feburito's subordinate nods and opening the cage, pulls the child out of the cage. The child is shackled with an iron collar. A rag is concealing the flaws in her skin and bones body. Her hair is something like a reddish orange. It's unkempt and has some white hairs mixed in. Her complexion is also bad. She was hugging herself and shivering. It might be because we're further into the storehouse, but it's a little cold. The eyes she's looking at us with are completely empty. She looks truly pitiful. Feburito's subordinate pays this no heed, and unhesitatingly removes the rag from the girl. Her skinny body, like a child who misses meals, is completely revealed. Seeing this, Fitch Senpai frowns. Rudius Kun. Be at ease. Even I have no intention of creating Pulitzer Prize winning photographs. Wanting to quickly buy her, feed her, and give her a warm bath. I'm filled with these kinds of feelings. However, I'm a bit worried about her eyes. Those empty eyes. I've seen eyes like those before. As you can see, it's a dwarf child. Six years old. 
possesses no skills in particular. Both parents are dwarves. Father was a blacksmith and mother created decorations. As long as it's hereditary, the dexterity of her hand should be as you wish. However, she can only understand the beast god language. Because we hadn't thought she'd sell, her health isn't the best. Because of that, we'll sell her at a discount. While making a difficult expression, Fitz Senpai approached the girl and touched her cheek. After a few seconds, the girl's complexion became somewhat better. He might have done something. Naturally she's a virgin. There are no concerns about infectious diseases and the like, but as you can see, she might be a little weak. The we'll treat her with healing magic upon purchase, this really isn't a good that we'd recommend. Fitz Senpai is looking at her with eyes like a child who's found an abandoned puppy. At any rate she's fulfilled the criteria so I was planning to buy her anyway though. Hello, little miss. I crouch down and speak to her in beast god language. The first step is to interview her. I'm Rudeus. You are? Dot. Actually, there was something we wanted you to do for us. Dot. Um. The girl just looked at me with empty eyes, and didn't reply at all. Feberito's subordinate brandishes the whip at his hip, but I stop him with my hand. Shizu, what's the matter? She's in quite a bit of despair. She's got the face of someone who hasn't any hopes at all and just wants to die. Have you seen that kind of face before, Shizu? In the past, many times you see. Zenoba and Fitch Senpai look like they're brooding over something. Well, it'd be best not to talk about things from my past life too much. It's just a lot of negative things after all. I looked at the girl for a little while. Their nostalgic eyes. In the past I had a period when I made eyes like this too. Let's see, it was when I had just passed 20 I think. I hadn't finished my education, I had no prospects, I had no job experience, and I was thinking that my life from now on would just be nothing but eating and shitting. They were the same eyes as that time. Thinking about it, at that time there were still things I could do. However, because I was despairing over my situation, I gave up on everything. After a few years, I became defiant about being a neat and got even worse, however. During that period of my life, I really didn't have a single hope. I just thought that I wanted to die. Do you want to die? Dot. You can't do anything about this yourself, huh? I can understand your feelings. Dot. The girl's eyes slowly noticed me. In that case, shall I end things for you? I said this seriously. I think my tone was light. I had truly thought that I wanted to die. However, without dying, I continued to live on, and on. It was a long time, filled with regrets. I can't save her from this kind of life. Of course I can buy her and give her work to do. I can buy her clothing, I can feed her food, and I can speak kind words to her. However, the fact that doing those kinds of things isn't saving her is something I should already understand very well. Forcing her to do things that she doesn't want to do is by no means saving her. In that case, it would be better to end things for her. If she became like me. If she was able to live another life after dying. It would be good if she could abandon her current life, and try her best in a new one. There's someone like that out there, without a doubt. Telling someone something like your hard work will pay off is just a pretense to make you feel better about yourself. I don't know if she's this kind of person. From my perspective, she can still keep at it. She's still young, or rather, very young, and as long as she tries her best from now on, whatever happens things will work out. However, it's not for me to say. I was someone who was an incurable idiot even up until death. It's something that depends on how willing she herself is. I'm not the one who gets to decide. Dot. Say something. The girl didn't tremble. However, she slowly parted her lips. Dash I don't want to die. She murmured only that. It was a feeble voice. Though it was a spiritless response, that's fine. It's just how it is. I was like that too. It's fine like that. It's fine even if she doesn't want to live. As long as she doesn't want to die, that's fine. 
we'll take her. I cover the girl with the robe that had been in my hands. I create hot air to warm her body, and chant detoxification magic. Recovery magic won't restore her strength, after this we'll let her eat. Feburito san, how much is she? One large azure copper coin five. That was how much the girl cost. After buying her, we cleaned the girl in the washing area that was in the corner of the marketplace. After that, we bought clothes and the like for her in the commercial districts, as well as other necessary items. We then entered a suitable cafe. It wasn't a simple eatery. It was a cafe with a good atmosphere. It's a shop that I definitely avoid where I buy myself. The one who picked it was Fit Senpai. Unlike me though, this kind of cafe suits Fit Senpai quite well. It can't be helped, but I feel out of place here and can't stop fidgeting. As expected of a royalty I might say, Zenoba is quite dignified. The girl we've just bought is single-mindedly shoveling food into her mouth. The only one who's uncomfortable is me. Fitz Senpai seemed to be in a good mood. While saying something like I'm glad, he's patting the girl on the head. By the way, Rudius Kun, what's this girl's name? Being asked that, I noticed that I haven't yet asked for her name. That Feburito didn't tell me her name. What's your name? The girl looks at my face as if she's heard something strange. Dot name? Huh? Could it be that my beast god language isn't getting through to her? It's certainly been about three years since I've used it, but it seemed to work fine in the great forest. Could it be that in the Dorudia village I was looked at like Michael, an American, self-proclaimed fluent Japanese speaker, who had just come to Tokyo? No, there's no way. The way I spoke shouldn't have been very different from Rui Jurd. Um, what do people call you? Dot Basel of the Sacred Iron and Lilitla of the Beautiful Snowy Ridges Child. Because that didn't quite seem to be what I was looking for, I conveyed what she said to Fitz Senpai. When I did, he went on, I see and nodded with a knowing look. The dwarves don't get a proper name until they reach seven years of age. Proper name? Amen, until age seven dwarves aren't given a name, and when they turn seven, they're given a name based on things they like, or things they admire, or things that they're good at for example. So he said. As expected of Fitz Senpai, he really is knowledgeable, huh? I see. It's quite inconvenient if she doesn't have a name. Her parents aren't here anymore, so there's no choice except for us to give her one. I see. We're going to give you a name now, but do you have any kinds of hopes? When I had asked this just in case, she tilted her head in puzzlement. I wonder if someone like this will really be able to create figurines. I've become a little uneasy. Since she's a girl, let's give her a lovely name. Fitz Senpai said that kind of girly line. Hearing this, on the contrary I start to want to give her a gallant and manly name. Ah, no good. No good. Zenoba. Let's hear your thoughts. When I said this, Zenoba turned towards us. Amen. Will it be fine if I decide? I'm not the one who paid after all. In that case, Julius. There's no mistake that he said that. He didn't look like he had thought about it. That's, a man's name, right? Yes, it's the name of the pitiful younger brother that I accidentally killed. I'm probably making a strange face. Fitz Senpai looks like he doesn't know what's going on. This child will be staying in my room, right? In that case, it'd be better for her to have a name that I'm comfortable with. Certainly, this child will end up living with Zenoba. As a room for royalty, Zenoba's room is large after all. I could also get permission and have her live in my room, but it'd be much easier for royalty to get permission. That's why although my room would be fine as well, we've naturally planned for her to stay with the rich Zenoba. That's how our conversation had gone. However, since she can't understand his words, it might be good for her to stay in my room instead. Another option might be for me to stay in Zenoba's room as well, 